Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to Zoo School Live. We have a very slow and awesome and brand new friend with us today, our sloth. And to help us learn all about her, we have two very special people in her life, actually three, um, two of her trainers and one of our educators. So I'm going to turn it over to them. They're going to tell you guys all about our friend and how we've started working with her and getting her ready for the big debut. All Hi, right, everybody. so I'll turn it over to Kara. Hi, everybody. My name is Kara. I am one of the educators here at Elmwood Park Zoo, and I am unbelievably honored to be a part of the development of our lovely new lady sloth here. Um, and then we also have one of her other mamas here as well. <laughs> Let her introduce herself. Hi guys, my name is Margaret, also one of the educators here at Alma Park Zoo. Yeah, we're so excited to introduce you to our new friend today. We have a lot of cool information about her. I have a lot to tell you about her uh, as we introduce her to you. So welcome back. <laughs> So let's start off by what on earth is this slow little creature? You guys mentioned she is a sloth, but what exactly is a sloth? Where do they live? All right, so uh, our lady here is mostly from the northern parts of South America. Uh, she lives typically in the canopies of tropical rainforests. Uh, that's where they find a whole lot of comfort for themselves. Um, if you don't know much about sloths, they are very slow moving. There is a reason for that, which I will get to later on. Uh, but because of their slow movement, that's basically why they hang out up in the trees for about 90% of their life. Uh, the other 10% would be about once a week, they do come down from those treetops to relieve themselves as all people and animals need to do. We do it on a much more frequent basis, but these guys only come down about once a week and that's for their safety. That's because they are so slow and they are designed specifically to hang in trees uh, and they're not very good at or walking. Their hind legs don't give them that ability. So when they are on the ground, the only thing they can do is really use those front feet to crawl across the floor. So as you can imagine, even on ground, they're not very fast. So they're gonna spend all their time up in those treetops in the nice safety. So this lady right here, she is a Linnaeus two-toed sloth. There are a few different species of sloth out there. Uh, Linnaeus two-toed are not as familiar uh, in the public. Most people are familiar with the three-toed sloth, uh, but we've got this lovely lady right here who's just got those two digits on her front feet. However, she does have three digits on the back as well. So uh, these guys have unbelievably strong limbs, and that is, as you can see, a very beneficial part for them because they're hanging upside down. Now, to you, she might look pretty big, but she is maybe only about halfway of what she is going to actually grow into. She's currently around nine pounds. Uh, she's gonna be able to potentially get up to about 20, if not more. She's gonna be a real big lady. So with that being said, with that amount of weight hanging upside down from a tree, if you can only imagine yourself hanging out of a tree all day long, your arms are gonna get real tired. So her limbs are unbelievably strong. Now the other really cool part about that is they have this locking mechanism in their feet that when they do need to take a nap, if they're not sitting upright, they're gonna hang upside down, lock those limbs around uh, the branches that they're on, and they're uh, gonna be able to fall asleep without risking falling off. Now, another thing they do when they sleep that I thought was pretty cool, because they are out in the trees, is that they're gonna tuck their head in between their limbs, so that way they kind of blend in with the tree a little bit more. But there is another way that they blend in with the tree that I really love. So sloths have ridges in their hair and th those ridges give them the ability to grow a specific type of greenish colored algae. So that greenish colored algae is actually gonna turn their fur a little green as well, which also helps them blend in with their surroundings. So they're very good at blending in, which is very beneficial for them because they are so slow. Now, another reason that they do only come down once a week out of the trees, and this is another slow part of their body, is their digestive system. So their stomachs 
uh, digest so slowly to give them the ability to come down less frequently, which is also, once again, a big part for their safety. Now, speaking of their digestive system, I know you can see she's being fed some snacks right now, so I'm sure you're curious what it is that she's eating. Uh, so with us in the zoo, she's going to be eating leafy greens, vegetables, and fruits. Uh, she does sometimes get some hard-boiled egg, which she very much enjoys, but her primary diet is leafy greens and veggies. Uh, now, her favorite snack is what uh, Educator Margaret is handing to her right now, and that is sweet potato. She will do just about anything for a sweet potato snack. Uh, I do very much agree. Sweet potato fries are my favorite. However, I don't get them nearly as much as she does. Uh, but she uh, goes through regular training with us, and that sweet potato is used for that. But I'm going to let Margaret take a moment to introduce the training that we do with her and why it's beneficial for her care. Great. I'm going to hand this snack pouch over to Kara here so she can distract me on us. <laughs> She's not all up in my grill while I talk to you guys about her training. Um, so some of the stuff we've been doing with her uh, since she got here is um, super important relationship building. Um, so Kara and I are her primary trainers right now. We're the people that are spending most of our time with her. Um, and most of her time with us, so uh, we want her to have a really, really strong relationship with the two of us. Um, <laughs> she's, she knows that I gave her food for most of the time here uh, today, so she thinks I'm going to give her more. Um, now, we've been doing a couple of things to get our relationships really strong. A lot of that is just going in with her and spending a lot of time with her, um, and that includes giving her a lot of hand feeding as well. So um, she is going to be Obviously a really important ambassador animal here today uh, at the zoo. Um, so she's going to be an ambassador for her species to teach people about sloths. Um, and uh, <laughs> she's too cute. So when you guys are building a relationship um, with her, what are some other um, things that you do to just kind of get her used to your presence? Did you guys, um, have you guys been giving her toys? Have you guys been giving her sounds to listen to, enrichment, like to get her used to different people being around? So other than you guys visiting and hanging out with her, um, what other things have you been doing to kind of prep her to be an ambassador? Yeah, so Miss uh, Ms. Sloth here does get, <laughs> that's one of the names I'm uh, voting for in the naming contest. If you guys do uh, want to vote for her name, we're really excited for that. Um, she obviously does not have a name yet, um, so we're really excited to announce that as soon as you guys do some voting in that contest. So feel free to go on the website to check that out or on Facebook. Um, now, like I was saying, we do some enrichment with her. Um, so enrichment in a zoo setting is really important for all of the animals. Um, so it's to keep them stimulated, to keep them um, entertain, make sure they don't get bored, and make sure they have a lot of different ways to uh, access their food. So we have a couple of different examples of enrichment that we do give her. Um, so this is one, it's uh, basically a little bit of a PVC pipe. And what we do is we hang this on the ceiling of her enclosure, and then we place food in here. And when she uh, is up during the nighttime, because she's nocturnal, so she's awake at night usually, um, she'll go around and she'll get the food that we leave her overnight. Um, same this, with this one. This is one of my favorites um, because you can really make it fun for her. We usually stick lettuce in this one and have lettuce sticking all out of it so that when she goes around, she doesn't get all her food um, really accessible easily. It makes it a little bit more difficult for her to forage around and find her food throughout the night rather than just getting one whole meal. Um, because in the wild, they would be foragers. They're going to eat food throughout the nighttime. So you guys give her these enrichment items to help build her strength and exploration and her comfort, right? That's right. Um, what have you guys been working on with her as far as training to help with her health care? Has she done any behaviors or been learning how to participate in her own health care? Yes. Yeah, so one really important thing we've been doing with her is um, working on some what's called tactile conditioning, which basically means touch. Um, so sometimes when we go in there with her, we'll give her some rewards while we touch different parts of her body. Um, that's going to be important for a lot of different reasons, but especially so that our, our vets can come in and give her her yearly checkups and have it not be a stressful situation for her. Um, so a lot of my focus when I'm going in and doing tactile conditioning with her is on her feet and her nails. Um, so 
a lot of times sloths in captivity have a little bit of problems with their nails growing a little longer, um, their feet can get a little bit dry because you really want to keep their humidity levels up. Um, so sometimes that can be a problem for them. So we actually put lotion on her little feet to make sure that she doesn't get uh, too dry at foot pads there. And I'm also working on touching her nails so that eventually we can do voluntary nail trims and have that not be a stressful situation for her when that comes up. Luckily, since she's still a baby, we don't have to do that quite yet. So we have some time to work on that with her um, and take our time with that. Is there any training that is being done to um, get her ready for display program, her exhibit? You know, I know the exhibit's not quite ready yet, so she's not out for public view, but she has this really cool setup I see here today with uh, this perch for her to explore. And how did you guys work on getting her comfortable doing this, coming out to visit in this kind of space? So one of the things that I have a lot of fun doing with this little lady right here is called target training. Now, target training is super beneficial for all animals, and that is because I can voluntarily move her from point A to point B without upsetting her, having to pick her up, or move her without her consent. Uh, so what we do is we have this lovely little target stick. Looks like a little boat buoy. It's on this lovely little stick right here, <laughs> nice and far. Uh, we had discovered uh, early on in her life that she does like the color blue, so this is very beneficial. Basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to hold the target stick out, verbalize to her that I want her to touch the target. What I'm looking for is that she walks up, poops it with her nose, and then I give her a reward. And that way I can move her from that end of the perch to this end of the perch without upsetting her and letting her do it on her own. Now that's also very beneficial because when we do transport her from one location to another and then we need to remove her from the transport basket that she currently loves uh, she will, will hold the target stick above the space where we want her to go and she'll just climb right on out uh, so the reason we're doing this is once we do have the exhibit open uh, if she's up in the treetops or if she's in her holding space and we would like her to come out we're going to display this target stick to allow her to come out on her own so we're going to see if she wants to try this out right now. She's been pretty good about it. However, we have been giving her quite a few snacks today. So fingers crossed she's going to do us proud right now. Yeah. Target. Sometimes she just takes a second to see it. She's going to come up. Boop that right with her nose. Target. We're going to let her chew her snacks first. So sometimes she gets real excited and she'll take a whole mouthful. Target. Good. Oop. Roll right off your face. Yeah, so target training is another really great way to build a relationship with her because I am allowing her to move on her own accord instead of forcefully picking her up or moving her in that way. Target. We'll see if we can turn her around. <laughs> She's like, where to go? Good job. Great. So when she does move out on exhibit, will she be sharing that space with any other animals? Yes. So that's another super exciting part is this lady right here is about to make a whole lot of new friends. We have made a point to introduce her to one or two to start off slowly for her comfort level. We don't want to overwhelm her so early. Plus, a lot of her friends can be a little bit loud. So. Some of the friends that you're going to be witnessing on this exhibit are new, and some of them uh, you might already be familiar with if you've visited in the past. So a couple of those are going to be uh, our parrots. So we've got our blue and gold macaw. Uh, we have our yellow crowned Amazon. A couple of our lovely little sun conures. Uh, so those are our friends that she uh, has already lived here prior, so they're excited to meet her as well. But we also have... Hank, our red-footed tortoise, which if you have seen any of the Zoo School Live episodes in the past, you might have seen him a time or two. We also have uh, a couple plush crested jays. Super excited to introdu introduce those to our collection. <laughs> They're very beautiful, super smart. Uh, we also have a flock of scarlet ibis which if you don't know what those are, they're about medium sized birds, look very similar to flamingos, but they are not. They're an entirely different species. And then who am I missing? Stuffy. 
Sun bitterns, that's correct. Those are our new friends as well. They've also just recently arrived. We have a lovely little male and female pair of sun bitterns that are really just beautiful birds. So as I said, a lot of her friends are going to be a wee bit noisy because they've got those beaks that can talk all day long. Uh, but we are very much excited for her to meet those friends. And how is she going to help um, be an ambassador for her species? I know you guys talked a little bit about training, how unique they are with their adaptations. Um, but, you know, are there challenges that wild sloths are facing that we're hoping people will learn about and, and help with by meeting and uh, visiting with our sloth? <laughs> Absolutely. So currently in the wild, this species is considered least concern. However, that does not mean that they're totally safe in the wild. So some of the threats that they might face would include uh, habitat loss. So that's mostly from humans uh, taking down habitats for different purposes. Uh, there's also, they do have predators in the wild. Um, I know I said that they're very good at blending in but there's always that risk. So these guys might fall predator to large cats of many sorts, large snakes, and then there are uh, other species as well, but those would be the most common. Um, aside from that, unfortunately, they, uh, there are some people out there that, that do hunt them. Um, however, that is not as common, I believe. I haven't found a whole lot of information about that. Uh, but habitat loss is really gonna be the big thing. Um, and unfortunately, because sloths are so cute and they look so cuddly, people very much are interested in uh, possibly having them as pets, which I can tell you is not a great idea. Uh, I know that they are cute, they are slow, but they do have uh, protective abilities. Those nails are super long. And even though you might not be able to see them real well, they do have very sharp teeth. And that is what they use to break through the leaves and branches and stuff that they'll eat out in the wild. Uh, but so it is very common sometimes with tourists that when they go out into the wild to meet wildlife, they might get too close and try to take pictures with them, which might make the wild animal uncomfortable. Uh, so our, our hope is that we can spread the message about taking care of your, both your local and um, foreign environments also as well as teaching people safe practices with wildlife. So that means keeping a safe distance. We understand that photo opportunities are very, very exciting for people, but there's always a safe way to do it. Um, and we wanna make sure that we spread and educate the ability, or spread and educate uh, that information to people so that way they do understand why maybe it's not the best idea to fully try to approach a sloth in the wild. Uh, but there is safe ways to do that. Awesome. We do have a few questions. So I've definitely been seeing a, a lot of stuff popping up about her name. So as Margaret was saying earlier, um, we all kind of have our little favorite names here that we're hoping for. But you are welcome to vote on our Facebook. And um, I believe there's a link. And then there was sent out, if you're a member at the zoo, it was sent out in an email. So you'll have some time still to do that. I'm not sure exactly when we're announcing that name, uh, but you'll check back to our social media and check your email to find out. Um, someone was asking, does she have a mate at this point, or is it just just her? No, as of right now, it's just her. So she, her best friends are us and the other animals that she's <laughs> going to live with. Um, but no, we do not have any other sloth friends for her just yet, maybe eventually. And Joseph, who's five, would like to know how long she sleeps during the day. That's a good question. So uh, typically in the wild, sloths are going to sleep between 15 to 20 hours a day. And that is also because of partially their slow digestive system. If they were to be moving around and awake a lot more than that, uh, they'd be burning through way more calories uh, and have to consume a lot more, come down from the treetops more but they are nocturnal. So they spend their night up in the dark treetops foraging for food in the safety of the, uh, the covers. And we actually have, in a lot of our animal enclosures, we have little cameras to check in on them. And it is very interesting watching the sloth move around at nighttime. It's, she's a lot more active than you would expect for a, such a slow creature. Yeah, typically we just find her sleeping during the day and we sometimes bother her and wake her up. But at nighttime, she is all over the place. <laughs> 
So Naomi asked, how old is she? So we just celebrated a birthday with her, right? Not yeah. too long ago. So April 16th was her first birthday, and uh, she has only been here with us for, for just two weeks. So uh, she, we unfortunately weren't there with her to celebrate, but uh, she did just turn one. <laughs> and she could grow a little bit more than this, right? Yes. Yeah, so she's not totally full grown yet. Not quite yet. Yeah, she's about half halfway to her full full size, which will be pretty big. Do either of you have a favorite sloth fact that you like to share with people? Something I think is really cool about them, um, another one of their freaky adaptations because they have so many, um, their fur kind of parts at their stomach and uh, grows that way around their back so that when they're hanging upside down in the rainforest, when it rains, um, the rainwater actually kind of runs off of their body down off their back. So I think that's really cool that they, they have that adaptation. Definitely. So my favorite is all about the feet. Um, <laughs> so I think their feet are so silly looking, but aside from that, just the way that they work mechanically, the way they have that ability to lock those, and how unbelievably strong they are, I just always thought that was so, so cool. Um, another thing is I did learn that when they are moving around in the treetops, they specifically have one foot directly over the other as they climb, and that's so just in case that one foot slips, the other one is directly above it to catch as they fall. Um, I'm a very clumsy person, so I <laughs> wish I had more ability to catch myself before falling, so that is something I really do love about these guys. Awesome. Well, just like um, other Zoo School episodes, if you have not had a chance to... Um, Put your question in the comments. Go ahead and do that. I think I did see one more pop up here. Um, how do they eat upside down? <laughs> do you guys know anything about how that works? Or we'll have to look that up and maybe share it later. Yeah, I am, I'm not entirely positive. Um, I know that like with bats, the way their bodies are designed, it's specifically uh, beneficial for them when they are upside down. Uh, I have not fully learned about the sloth uh, digestive tract or the way any of that works yet. I'm still still learning as, as we go. So thanks for that question, Nancy. We'll see if we can get an answer for you and we'll pop back into the, the comments and, and post that. Um, again, if you are want to participate in the uh, naming, we have a survey out there. You're welcome to join in and then we'll keep you guys updated throughout um, the next couple weeks on her new exhibit space and everything else super cool sloth related. Thank you so much to Kara and Margaret for sharing her with us today. Thanks for joining us, guys. It was so much fun to introduce her to you. We can't wait uh, for you guys to come meet her in person when that new exhibit's open. All right, guys. Thanks so much for joining us, and I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Bye.